Well, welcome back. We're about to have the opportunity to listen to Sister Carol Keehan's reflection on our faith and legislation. But like we did before, let's take a moment of centering ourselves. Check your posture. Get settled up straight. Watch your breathing. And let's center ourselves and let the spirit rise up within us. Remember, if you want to argue, take a breath and let it go. Maybe the edge of spiritual growth for you. And then if you want to, you know, just kind of jump for joy, let that go too. Because the whole goal of this time together is to let something new emerge, to not be in control. You ready? You can do this. Sister Carol's a great presenter. We will have a lot to say afterwards, but let's first listen deeply to her message. Take a deep breath. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you this afternoon, even virtually. I'd really looked forward to being with you, and am delighted that we can at least do this much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for asking me to talk about our faith, church teaching, and legislation. That's quite a mix. Our faith. We could not ask for a better heritage. Even throughout the Old Testament, core values stand out. The vulnerable, the sick, the widow, the orphan, the immigrant, children, parents, the elderly, and the stranger. We are called to special respect and care for each of them. Yet from the beginning, we see human frailty and sin challenging and rejecting these core values, and that results in great harm and injustice to so many. Think of the wars, persecutions, unjust laws, and in our own day, the Holocaust, racism, massive economic inequity, abortion, capital punishment, and environmental destruction, to mention only a few. However, throughout the centuries, when we as church are at our best, there is so much to admire, take pride in, be inspired by, and learn from. Whether you look at our history in music and art, our work in education, social services, and healthcare, not to mention the focus heroes in our church have so effectively put on assuring the poorest among us could share in these advances. We can justly toast what a gift our faith is to our world. For us in the United States, this is incredibly true. Despite some missteps and flaws, our faith has led us to work diligently and effectively in all these areas. Our educational systems, healthcare and social service programs are renowned. For instance, in healthcare, which I know best, Catholic sisters and Catholic brothers developed healthcare facilities, often under extremely unfavorable circumstances, that today form the largest not for profit health system the world has ever known. There has been incredible good done in them for so many, for centuries, motivated by the tenets of our faith. Our faith is crystal clear that we are created in the image and likeness of God and that that has profound implications. It commands certain views of the other and behaviors in big and small matters. It demands that we use certain criteria to make choices and gives us incredible help in our individual and collective journeys to live that faith. In these challenging times, I know so many of you have worked so hard to help people in every age group understand in the face of the horrible failures 
and scandals, that they result from flawed humanity, not a flawed faith. Our faith remains our most valuable touchstone for decisions. This leads us to the second segment, church teaching. Church teaching is how most of us sort out what our faith calls us to in various situations, from marriage to labor unions to political stands. There are so many church documents that not only inspire and guide us, but make us so very proud. Consider Rerum Novarum, Gaudium et Spes, Laudato Si, to mention only a few. As Catholics, we are called to respect and study church teaching. We are also called to contribute our insights and expertise to the development and evolution of church teaching. Through the ages, we have seen this in critical areas such as science, economics, medicine, marriage, labor, and many other areas. We have also seen that this can be quite a messy affair in every age. Whether you think of Galileo, the Jesuits in usury, religious liberty and the council, birth control, the synod on the family, and even the synod on the Amazon, not to mention the Affordable Care Act, it can be a bumpy ride to get to truth. Bumpy ride or not, we have an obligation to help the church know and understand important issues, problems, and their impact. For some of us, it can be a very focused area like science, but for some, it can be an area with broad implications, such as health care or racism. You, as priests, have invaluable insights on the reality of so many issues. Health care, economics, immigration, abortion, communion rules, education, marriage. You deal with these every day. And you hear confessions. Church leadership desperately needs your insight. Jesus is so clear in the gospel about religious leaders who lay burdens on people they cannot carry and then do nothing to help them. You know well the burdens people are carrying that we should help lift. It is often risky to try to contribute. You can be criticized for not being loyal to the church, not accepting church teaching, and many other painful accusations. But our conscience often compels us to action. We are all called to have a properly formed conscience and to follow it. The duty to do this is explicit church teaching. It was beautifully expressed by the Second Vatican Council in Gaudium et Spes. In the section on the dignity of the moral conscience, the council teaches in the depths of his conscience, man detects a law which he does not impose upon himself, but which holds him to obedience, always summoning him to love good and avoid evil. The voice of conscience can, when necessary, speak to his heart more specifically. Do this, shun that. For man has in his heart a law written by God. To obey it is the very dignity of man. According to it, he will be judged. Conscience is the most secret core and sanctuary of a man. There he is alone with God, whose voice echoes in his depths. A few years ago, Pope Benedict XVI reinforced this point, that obedience to one's conscience was more important than obedience even to the Pope. We all know about the responsibility to form the correct conscience and that it takes prayer, study, and developing expertise. In our very complex world, no one, no matter their competence or high office, can know everything 
or have the best perspective on everything. It is the duty of those in power to seek out truth and the duty of those with expertise, experience, and insight to share it. Recently, the church canonized a saint who was clear on the importance of this for the church. St. Oscar Romero wrote in his book, The Violence of Love, we bishops, popes, priests, nuns, Catholic educators, we are human, and as humans, we are sinful, and we need someone to be a prophet for us and to call us to conversion and not let us set up religion as something untouchable. Religion needs prophets, and thank God we have them, because it would be a sad church that felt itself the owner of truth and rejected everything else. Noble words. Helping church teaching be the best it can be at the service of the people of God is something we should all contribute to. Maintaining the right balance between church teaching and legislation and how they should impact each other can be mutually enriching, but it is certainly challenging. Using the moral insights and wisdom of church teaching can be incredibly helpful in writing good legislation. Over the years, we have seen multiple proofs of that in programs that benefit the poor, decisions about human rights and just war, just to name a few. Using the church to create a political win for partisan positions that bear little real relation to the church value being espoused is corrupt, and so often the church is hurt by it. Archbishop Gregory recently gave some examples of this in church history when the church became too connected to politics. Recently at Mass at Santa Marta, Pope Francis asked the congregation to pray for men and women who have a vocation to politics, calling it a high form of charity. Our interactions with politicians should help them pursue their vocation to that, not just be another constituent wanting to do a deal. That is hard in a legislative and cultural environment that today is so polarized and driven by money and manipulated by untruths. Even though we may not want to swim in that pool, we must for the good of our country and especially the most vulnerable. This brings us to actual legislation. Talk about something that can be a force for good or evil. We are all citizens and must be attentive to this. We are all Catholics and have a baptismal calling to be faithful to. Our efforts to form a more perfect union in a very pluralistic and unfortunately polarized society are very challenging. Protecting the vulnerable, whether the unborn, little children, young people, families, the disabled or the elderly is our responsibility. Legislation is an inescapable part of it. Perhaps a little stroll down memory lane over the high and low points of the Affordable Care Act will illustrate some of the opportunities and pitfalls of being involved in legislation. Church teaching is clear. Everyone deserves health care. You can't be pro-life without it. The National Academy of Medicine study documented over 18,000 lives lost unnecessarily each year in our country because of a lack of access to health care. The economy was suffering. Over 18% of our GDP went to health care, and still we were the only industrialized nation without health care for all. The 14 largest nations all spent half of what we spend, and their outcomes in quality, morbidity, availability, and patient satisfaction 
were all much higher than the United States, no matter who researched the issue. In short, no one was winning and the poor carried the heaviest burden. The Catholic Health Association and many others felt the time was here and we should be part of making it happen with a good bill. The USCCB was for the cause and no one wanted health care for all more than Cardinal Francis George. CHA worked with lots of groups, including the USCCB. In every group, group we were clear, health care for all was our major cause, but there was a price we would not pay, and that was abortion. We would not compromise uh, on principles, but we would compromise on policies. The ACA was landmark legislation, and we had a leader in the Republican Party saying his major goal for the next four years was that President Obama would not get a second term. Immediately, all the pitfalls and hot button issues were being pushed. This legislation would be the biggest increase in abortion in history. The government was setting up death panels and they would tell you if you could treat the elderly and the disabled or not. After 70 years of age, no more insulin for old people and no joint replacements, etc. This legislative effort would be too big a win and it must be stopped. The rhetoric was very effective and combined with the postcard campaign, you'll remember, and other efforts to assure that disaster was imminent, we spent so much time talking about what was not in the bill and could not get people to hear what actually was in the bill. There were lots of other groups who had concerns who were being successfully baited to oppose the bill. You would have socialist health care. Employer health care was out. A government takeover of health care was upon us. I cannot tell you how many letters I got saying, do not make me take government health care. I don't want it. I have Medicare or I have VA health care. You used to pray for a civics lesson for some people. It became clear that part of the staff at USCCB was intent as well on preventing the bill from passing. They were closely coordinating with groups like the Beckett Fund and Focus on the Family. All very impressive names. I heard pro-life champion Representative Bart Stupak warn some of the bishops that these groups were more pro-Republican than pro-life. CHA committed to getting a bill that did not fund abortion and we felt that we had succeeded. President Obama, in a televised joint session of Congress, said there would be no federal funding of abortion. The bill explicitly says no federal funds can be used to fund abortion except the Hyde Amendment. The president issued an executive order saying no federal funds could be used for abortion. And we got a congressional colloquy with the chair of the committee going on record that the congressional intent was no federal funds will be used for abortion. We did this last thing in case later there was a question in a lawsuit about what Congress meant by what it said in the bill. We were getting close and Cardinal George was still saying he wanted to be on record with CHA supporting it, but he had concerns. I offered to come to his office and go over it, and he was grateful. I spent two hours at his home answering questions and then reviewed the potential joint letter. He told me he liked the letter, might change a word or two, but wanted to sign it and would get back to me in a day or two. 
I never heard from him again, in spite of repeated attempts to reach him. As you know, the bill passed, in spite of all the roadblocks. And over 20 million people who had no coverage got coverage. Epidemiologists can now show proof that in states that implemented it fully, people who are poor after five years have demonstrable improvements in their health status, especially compared to states that did not implement the bill fully. People who had commercial insurance got major improvements in it with the no pre-existing condition and the no lifetime limits on expenses and keeping their adult children on it until they were 26. Importantly, the abortion rate in the United States has never been lower since the Roe v. Wade decision. Tensions between the bishops and CHA were not fun, and it is no picnic to be picketed and attacked or to have the Secretary of State at the Vatican pull you off a program and put you off a Vatican board. But the poor won, and they so rarely do. It was wonderful to see a few years later when a Republican Congress was trying to vote the ACA out, our bishops wrote several letters asking them not to do it. We are in a very challenging <clears throat> and pivotal moment in U.S. history, and the ride to November promises to be rough. We have to reinforce our health care system, our public health system, our economic system, our racial justice reality, and protect the most vulnerable who have been hurt the most by the pandemic and all of that in an election year. We will not make progress in these without changing our modus operandi and in our country. We must find a way to help stimulate public conversations on mutual respect and civility in public discourse. We must be examples of respectful listening even to those we profoundly disagree with. We cannot seek to win by crushing others or refusing to believe there is any good in them. Let me illustrate what I mean with an example you are sure to be confronted about before November. Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973. It legalized abortion in the entire country. For many citizens, this was a tragedy and considered a serious moral failure. The added burden to them was the fact that in many of the health plans funded by the federal government, their tax dollars would be used to pay for this. The Hyde Amendment was originally passed in 1977. This legislative provision bars the use of federal funds to pay for abortion. Originally, the only exception was the life of the mother. It was altered in 1981 to add rape and incest as circumstances that would allow the use of federal funding to provide for abortions. States were still allowed to spend their own money to pay for abortions, and currently 17 states do this. This compromise was reached with the input of many people on both sides of the abortion question. The bishops in the United States played a large role in achieving this, as did many other faith-based and non-faith-based groups. In 2016, the Democratic platform called for the repeal of the Hyde Amendment. What was seen by many over the years as a reasonable compromise that accommodated the rights of people on both sides of the question imperfectly, but at least fairly, is no longer seen that way. Some of what caused this change has been possibly a well-intentioned effort at limiting the reach of groups such as Planned Parenthood, 
who are major providers of abortion, but also in fairness, providers of other women's health services. Efforts to use regulation and legislation to eliminate their eligibility to provide any services to women, such as contraception, mammograms, and general physicals, have angered and energized many groups. The former willingness to accept the Hyde Amendment on regulations and budget bills has almost disappeared in Congress. Losing the Hyde Amendment would be a challenging problem. However, it is hard to determine how much it would impact the number of abortions. From a teaching perspective for the church, some over the years have come and now equate the Hyde Amendment with the church's teaching on abortion, which it, it absolutely is not. It is a compromise reached with an awareness that we live in a pluralistic society. Can we work with bishops and other groups on both sides and legislators to find a way for a version of the Hyde Amendment that respects rights and perspectives of all? If not, on this issue and so many more, we are doomed to bitter, ineffective conflict. Given our faith, we have much to offer in changing the tone and tenor of this and other debates. Think and dare to dream how much good it would do. Thank you very much for all you do every day for the people of God, especially the most vulnerable. May God bless you. I look forward to your questions. That was a stirring presentation. Let's take a moment and center ourselves again. Breathe in, and as you breathe out, let go of all of the plans, ideas, reactions, and find your centered self at peace again. Take another deep breath and let the spirit rise up in you and be prepared to share with curiosity. third deep breath and open your heart to where we might be being called. And now centered, let's move forward.